On today's episode, new details on the final flight of Starship Block 1. Sierra Space is moving forward while standing still, the Chinese have built something strangely familiar, and Nancy Grace Roman gets a new instrument. The SpaceX Starship is launching for the sixth time as early as November 18th. That's by far the fastest turnaround we've seen yet, just about one month, and that's down from three months earlier this year between March and June. This flight promises some very exciting new surprises, and we've got details. The biggest difference between Flight 6 and all of the others that have come before is the launch window. SpaceX is targeting liftoff as early as 4 p.m. local time, which is 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time in North America. So that means not only will the launch itself be happening in broad daylight, it means that the return of the ship stage will also happen in daylight hours halfway around the world over the Indian Ocean. SpaceX says this will provide better conditions for visual observation. So if all goes according to plan, we'll have the first ever high quality video of a starship returning from space. Now this re-entry will be a little bit different from what we've seen before. Of course, SpaceX is going to take any opportunity they can get to test new things. So while the suborbital trajectory remains the same, several thermal protection experiments and operational changes will test the limits of Starship capability and generate flight data to inform plans for future Starship catch and reuse. The biggest change will actually be the removal of large sections of heat shield tiles from the upper stage. This is going to be done on the sides of the ship in areas where the Mechazilla catch arms will interface with the rocket. SpaceX says they're studying locations for catch enabling hardware on future vehicles. This makes a lot of sense. If we look back to the way the tower caught the Super Heavy on Flight 5, the chopstick arms bang against the side of the rocket a couple times before the pins hit the rails. If you were to do the same maneuver on a ship stage, you'd likely damage the ceramic heat shield tiles in the areas where those arms hit, which would hinder the reusability aspect. SpaceX also says that the ship will fly at a higher angle of attack during the final phase of descent, which will purposefully stress the limits of aeroflap control, and this will help them gain data on future landing profiles. One of the big advantages of the new launch time is that it's going to make things a lot more feasible for us to attempt live coverage of the event here on the Space Race channel. That's right. Sean and I are thinking that we could do our first ever live broadcast on YouTube for Flight 6 on November 18th. It's not going to be anything fancy, it's just going to be two dudes hanging out and watching a rocket launch, so if you're down for that, we'll have some more details to follow in the next week. Stay tuned. Anyway, back to the news. Here's another exciting new milestone for Flight 6. At T plus 37 minutes, there will be a Raptor in space relight demo. SpaceX says they're going to burn a single Raptor engine as the ship coasts through space, about 10 minutes prior to re-entry. This is something that was supposed to have been tried way back on Flight 3, but that was aborted on the account of the ship rolling around out of control. So they're going to circle back to that test, and this is important to demonstrate that Starship can slow itself down in space, which will be required on a true orbital mission. Of course, SpaceX is going to attempt another catch of the Super Heavy booster on Flight 6, and hopefully this will look very similar to the previous catch, just maybe a little less drama involved. SpaceX says there are hardware upgrades for this flight that add additional redundancy to booster propulsion systems, increase structural strength at key areas, and shorten the timeline to offload propellants from the booster following a successful catch. Mission designers also updated software controls and commit criteria for the booster's launch and return. So hopefully this means a little less fire in the engine bay, less pieces flying off, and hopefully we won't come within one second of the computer triggering a false abort code this time. And what's really special about Flight 6 is that this will be the last one to feature the classic Starship upper stage design that we all know so well. This is the end of an era. Flight 7 will transition to the Block 2 Starship which SpaceX says will fly with significant upgrades including redesigned forward flaps, larger propellant tanks, and the latest generation of tiles and secondary thermal protection layers as they continue to iterate towards a fully reusable heat shield. So a good reminder here that there is still a lot to learn when it comes to getting Starship to its fully operational state. Much more excitement still to come. Just like a rocket launch, the success of your night out depends on solid preparation. 
Zbiotics Pre-Alcohol Probiotic is here to help ensure a smooth re-entry the next day. Created by PhD scientists, it's the world's first engineered probiotic designed to handle the rough mornings that can follow a few drinks, so you can wake up feeling fresh and ready to take on your day's mission. When you enjoy alcohol, it's converted in the gut to a byproduct that often causes that next day drag. Zbiotics produces an enzyme to break this byproduct down, helping you feel your best the following day. It's simple. Drink Zbiotics before your first drink, enjoy responsibly, stay hydrated, and get a good night's rest. The next day, you'll be ready to explore new frontiers, whether that's diving into a new discovery in space or handling a busy day. Now with the approaching holiday season, it's the perfect time to give it a try. Head to zbiotics.com slash space race and use the code space race at checkout to get 15% off your first order. And with a 100% money back guarantee, there's no risk. Just scan the QR code on the screen to get started and make this holiday season one to remember, minus the next day drag. Thank you to Zbiotics for sponsoring this episode and supporting the channel. I'll tell you who's not delivering on the excitement right now though, Sierra Space. Dream Chaser Tenacity was supposed to launch for the first time this year. Now that's been pushed back to May 2025 at the earliest, but that doesn't mean things are quiet over at Sierra headquarters. According to a new update, the company is moving forward with construction of their second cargo space plane named Reverence, in addition to building out the first mission control center to support Dream Chaser operations. From recent photos, it looks like the second DC-100 space plane is still in a pretty early phase of construction. Just the outer frame of the fuselage has been done so far. The company says that they are still about 18 months out from completion, which would tell us that it still takes them about two years to build one of these, and that seems a bit too slow. Hopefully there's opportunity to accelerate that. The company says they're also working on a crewed variant, the DC-200 series, and a national security model, the DC-300. 300. Sierra says that each space plane is good for 15 missions, so between tenacity and reverence, assuming that downtime between missions is kept relatively short, that should be enough for regular operations flying twice a year or so. NASA has already contracted out six cargo resupply missions to the ISS using Dream Chaser and the Shooting Star cargo module, which is one thing that Sierra appears to have already built multiple of. This is essentially a separate spacecraft that can operate independently from Dream Chaser. Shooting Star provides a lot of versatility that can be explored in future missions. NASA already has two supply ship options right now with the Cygnus and Dragon, but the Dream Chaser and Shooting Star combo adds some capabilities that wouldn't be possible with the existing vehicles. There's more payload capacity with Sierra Space, and an opportunity to return sensitive payloads to Earth by touching down on a runway. It would give NASA something closer to what they had with the old Space Shuttle, only for significantly less money this time around. Hopefully at least. NASA has not funded any of the crew-rated operations with the DC-200, that's something that Sierra is pushing for independently at the moment. The company is also establishing their first mission control center at the company headquarters in Colorado. It's going to have a live link to NASA's Johnson Space Center and will be staffed by about a dozen people. The team is currently being trained on how to fly Dream Chaser in simulated missions. Some of these simulations are being done in partnership with NASA and United Launch Alliance, whose Vulcan Centaur is going to be responsible for getting Dream Chaser into orbit. The idea is that by flying Dream Chaser over and over in the virtual environment, they'll have all the kinks worked out before the real deal comes around. Using simulation allows Sierra to throw failures and high stress situations at their ground crew in order to temper them for the real world. Going back to Starship here for a second, apparently there's a big air show happening right now in the southern Chinese city of Zhuhai. One of the exhibits is showing off a scale model of the latest concept for the Long March 9 rocket. Check this out, it looks familiar? The design change was hinted at a month ago by China's Deep Space Exploration Laboratory. The idea is to eventually achieve a two-stage reusable heavy lift rocket by 2033. Long March 9 has been in development for quite a long time now. It started off as a more conventional rocket design with a 10 meter core stage surrounded by four giant side boosters. Then it transitioned to a more streamlined single core reusable booster with 30 engines, which was already a bit of a Starship knockoff. Now they've basically just photocopied a Starship with their latest iteration. 
Of course, this isn't an art competition, it's spaceflight, so physics is going to dictate your design choices, and in theory, there can only be one correct answer to building the ideal reusable upper stage, so looks like SpaceX just got there first. Now here is something that is definitely new. It's called the Roman Coronagraph, and it's just been integrated into the instrument carrier for NASA's Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope, which is a next-generation space observatory that will investigate the mysteries of dark energy, exoplanets, and infrared astrophysics. The Roman Coronagraph is designed to block starlight which will enable scientists to detect the presence of very faint planets that are far beyond our solar system. The coronagraph, which is roughly the size of a baby grand piano, is a sophisticated system composed of masks, prisms, detectors, and self-flexing mirrors that work together to block the glare from distant stars, allowing scientists to detect the planets orbiting them. This would be a departure from the traditional transit method of exoplanet observation, which is what we've been doing so far. We just wait for the exoplanet to pass between the Earth and a star, then we measure the change in the starlight. But we're not really able to image and investigate the planets themselves. This can only be done with very large and very bright ones. Installation of the coronagraph is a significant milestone for the new space telescope, which is scheduled to launch as early as May 2027, and will offer a field of view 100 times larger than Hubble. Not only will Nancy Grace Roman reveal secrets of dark energy and black holes, it's going to be used as a proving ground for new technology that could detect alien life. This would lead into NASA's next next-generation telescope, which will be the Habitable Worlds Observatory, the first telescope designed specifically to search for signs of life on exoplanets.